As a whistleblower complaint filed against President Trump rocks Washington and threatens Trump's presidency, we spend the hour with one of the world's most famous whistleblowers, Edward Snowden. Six years ago, Snowden leaked a trove of secret documents about how the United States had built a massive surveillance apparatus to spy on Americans and people across the globe. He gave the information to reporters. In May 2013, Snowden quit his job as an NSA contractor in Hawaii and flew to Hong Kong, where he met three reporters, Glenn Greenwald, Laura Poitras and Ewan McCaskill, who began publishing a series of articles exposing the NSA and the surveillance state. Snowden was then charged in the United States for violating the Espionage Act and other laws. In order to avoid being extradited to the United States, he attempted to fly from Hong Kong to Latin America, transiting through Moscow. But Snowden became stranded in Russia after the U.S. revoked his passport. He has lived in Moscow ever since. Edward Snowden has just published his memoir. It's called Permanent Record. He writes about what led him to risk his life to expose the U.S. government's system of mass surveillance. Juan Gonzalez and I spoke to him from his home in Moscow Wednesday. We talked about his book, his work as an intelligence contractor, the ongoing debate about privacy rights online, and the latest news from Washington, where a whistleblower complaint against President Trump has helped push House Democrats to launch an impeachment inquiry. I began by asking Ed Snowden about the Justice Department's new lawsuit against him, claiming his memoir violates nondisclosure agreements he signed with the C. CIA and National Security Agency. I asked him to respond to the Trump administration's threat to seize the proceeds from the book because he didn't submit the manuscript for review before it was published. Uh, well, I mean, in general, everyone can see what this is. Uh, the United States government, largely the intelligence community, uh, uh, agencies within it, uh, very much don't want to see uh, books like this published. Um, any kind of true and honest accounting of the actual facts of the government's uh, unlawful or potentially unconstitutional behavior is always going to cause some friction. And the first thing they go to uh, is what they call a, a secrecy agreement. Um, now, this is not an oath of secrecy. A lot of people think it is. Uh, when you first join the CIA, uh, you do swear an oath, um, but it's not an oath of secrecy. Uh, it's not to the agency. It's not even to the government. It's not to the president. It's an oath of service to support and defend the Constitution of the United States against, as we all know, all enemies, foreign and domestic. Um, so this raises the question, of course, of, of what do you do? When your obligations uh, come into conflict, to what do we owe uh, a, a greater allegiance, the Constitution or the standard Form 312, uh, Classified Nondisclosure Agreement? Uh, my belief is the Constitution prevails in that kind of conflict. Now, the government uh, is saying, because I signed this agreement, um, regardless of whether it's right or wrong, uh, regardless of whether the book has any classified or uh, does not have any classified material in it, and by the way, it doesn't, um, at least not anything that's been published, not already published in newspapers around the world, uh, they go, all right, well, we're going to take all the money for it. And this is because uh, not that they go, the Department of Justice, when they uh, brought this complaint, they were very clear, very precise to say, we're not banning the book, we're not trying to stop publication. Uh, and they couch it in language that makes it appear like this was a, a choice they made, that they were being generous. Um, but the reality is that they couldn't, because they're forbidden from doing so by the, the First Amendment. All they can do is go after the money. Uh, and we simply just have to remember that financial censorship is still censorship. But that doesn't bother me, because I didn't write this book to make money. And what does it mean that um, they have sued you? What effect has that uh, had on your book? Um, it's uh, actually a funny story. Uh, we were at about uh, number 25 on the charts. It had been a pretty quiet launch, uh, because a lot of the more corporate media in the United States doesn't really want to talk about things like whistleblowing well until this week. Um, and so uh, it, it sort of went under the radar. And then the very day of the launch, um, uh, about four or five hours afterwards, we could see that the hour by hour. Uh, metrics of how the book was doing, uh, we went from number 25 right up to number one. Uh, so you can see the attorney general is uh, really the best front man for this book that uh, I could possibly ask for. And on Tuesday, the HuffPost ran an article headlined, The Trump Whistleblower Scandal is Proving Edward Snowden Right. 
In the piece, Nick Bauman writes, quote, "...now a whistleblower inside the intelligence community is trying to do what Snowden claimed he couldn't. So far, that person has been effectively silenced by the Trump administration's refusal to provide the complaint to Congress as required by law. It's possible that the administration will eventually comply with its legal obligations. But the political system has already sent a clear signal. Even intelligence community whistleblowers who follow the law can't be confident their concerns will be heard. Can you respond to this and the decision you made to go a very different route, Ed? How best do we inform the public, uh, whether we are government employees, whether we are uh, contractors working in the intelligence community, uh, whether we are ordinary citizens uh, who witness serious wrongdoing? Um, what can we do? And particularly what happens when we start being burdened by all of these non-disclosure agreements? Um, this case that we see before us today is, I think, actually quite clear-cut. Uh, it's one of the simplest cases and simplest controversies we've seen in a while, um, because we're talking about uh, what appears to be, at least as alleged in the press so far, uh, is a single exchange, um, a, a single complaint about a particularized thing. And it doesn't threaten the institutions of power broadly. This is about the activities of an individual. And what we see in, in the system that's been built today uh, for whistleblowing um, is you're told uh, there are proper channels that you go through, uh, and you'll be safe if you do this. You will be heard, uh, and your complaints will be investigated, and any improprieties uh, that are borne out by the facts will be corrected. We know historically this is not the case. Um, there have been academic articles uh, published for years, and there was actually one uh, just published today, uh, looking back through previous cases of, for example, NSA whistleblowers who did go through this process, and they had their lives destroyed. Um, they lost their careers, they lost their homes, uh, in some cases they lost their families uh, because of the stress and retaliation um, and, and consequences they faced. Some of them lost their freedom. Uh, Chelsea Manning right now is sitting in prison. Uh, we have had uh, so much mistreatment of whistleblowers here. And the question that we have to ask is why? Don't we need, as a public, uh, to understand what the government is doing? Don't, does not the press require access uh, to sources and evidence of what the government is actually doing behind closed doors, which it might not think is comfortable for the public to know, uh, but certainly it serves the public interest uh, for the people to know. And so in, in this context, right, uh, we, we now have someone who's coming forward. And the, the reason I say this is so clean cut um, is more than any other factor, what academics find um, when they look at the, what's wrong with the whistleblowing process in the United States today is your outcome uh, is entirely determined uh, by the centers of power and how they respond to it. Now, we have three branches in our government, as everyone knows. Uh, you've got the White House, you've got uh, the Congress, and then you've got the judiciary. Well, in my case, in the case of most of the, the consequential whistleblowers of the, um, the last decades, uh, even going as far back, actually, as, as Ellsberg and the Pentagon Papers in the 1970s, uh, they have been reporting failures uh, that cross the branches. It's not about an individual. Um, it's uh, about policy broadly uh, that was put forward by the executive. It was backstopped or ignored by Congress, uh, and the courts refused to uh, evaluate the legality of it. In this case, it's quite different. Uh, and this is the reason I think, uh, although this whistleblower is absolutely being mistreated by this White House, and this White House is doing absolutely everything they can to stop this person from communicating uh, what the public needs to know to the public in a meaningful way uh, so that we can evaluate it, um, I do not think they will succeed. Because in this case, the White House is in isolation uh, and in, in a meaningful way uh, in opposition uh, to the Congress that feels their prerogatives uh, are, are being stepped on by this. Uh, and that's quite unusual in the context of whistleblowing. Typically, we see all three branches of government align against the whistleblower. Uh, in this case, because the uh, at least alleged bad behavior uh, is so bright line clear, um, and because uh, the White House is trying to deny Congress access to the complaint uh, more so than, than the public itself, uh, 
I think there are enough people uh, who will go to bat for whoever this person is uh, that they will end up all right. And that's actually a wonderful thing. Um, it's not enough, uh, and whistleblowers are today and, and will remain, uh, unfortunately, a vulnerable class until we fix the, the broader system. But the most uh, alarming part of, of what we see in the treatment of this person today uh, by the White House is what every White House does. Uh, they try to make the conversation not about the allegations. They try to make the conversation about the source of the allegations. They want to talk about uh, the whistleblower uh, rather than the government's own wrongdoing. Um, and we need to uh, have access to the facts, and we need to hear this person uh, out, um, because it doesn't matter uh, the provenance of an allegation. What, what matters is the proof of it. Uh, is what this person alle is alleging uh, to be true, in fact true? Uh, and if it is, what are we going to do about it? Who they are does not matter. Uh, whether or not the allegations uh, they are leveling uh, are true matters absolutely. What's your perspective on the raging debate in Europe over the right to be forgotten, the privacy, greater privacy protections that the European Union is attempting to uh, uh, institute? So these, uh, the it's called the GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation in Europe. Um, that is a major step forward uh, in that uh, we now have uh, advanced democracies that are trying to recognize, essentially, a kind of ownership right in records about us. Now, it's crude, it's simplistic, it's too parochial. It doesn't work in a meaningful way yet, uh, but theoretically, uh, it holds the potential for enormous fines for the internet giants in the world if they misbehave and abuse the public as a class. Um, as you say, uh, one of the, the primary sort of ideas behind this is a right to be forgotten, which is you can demand from a, a company uh, basically an understanding of all the records they have on you, and you can demand that they delete them in some cases. Uh, and this actually is a tremendously beneficial thing. The problem is, uh, and, and where the hard, the, the, the sharp end of this uh, conflict comes into view, is well, what about public figures? Um, what if this is someone uh, who is engaged in corruption? Uh, what if this is a politician who is trying to bury a scandal? Uh, can they go to a newspaper and go, you have to remove this article about me? Of course, they, they cannot and they, they must not be able to do that. Uh, that is still uh, a legal struggle in, in Europe today to figure out where to uh, find that line. But I think we, uh, as average people, understand quite well the difference between a private citizen and a public uh, official. These terms mean something to us. We are supposed to know everything uh, about the people who wield the most power in society. Um, and they are supposed to know very little about uh, us who have very little influence over the direction of the future. Uh, because privacy is about power, it's about influence, and this is uh, what we have been robbed of uh, over these last decades. Uh, the government increasingly has tried to change this paradigm, and this is the ultimate result of systems of mass surveillance, uh, by which I mean sort of this dragnet uh, interception of everyone's communications, regardless of whether you're uh, actually suspected of any wrongdoing or you're simply uh, getting caught up with everyone else. And um, this is that governments are increasingly aggressive in asserting different kinds of secrecy privileges, whether it's the actual state secrets doctrine, uh, which they use to defend classified information, or what we see in this case uh, of the whistleblower uh, who's the talk of the town this week, uh, which is the government actually does not seem to be especially concerned about classified information here. Of course, they, they nod toward that, but if you look at the analysis, they're actually arguing uh, they're more concerned about executive privilege. And this is where internal White House uh, deliberative processes don't need to be shared externally. They can say we can guard these from public view. Um, but the bottom line of this is increasingly we're living in a time where whether we're talking about governments or whether we're talking about uh, Google and Facebook, um, the institutions of greatest power in the world today are increasingly able to shelter their behaviors uh, from our view. At the same time, they know more about us, our families, our communities, and our societies than any government has in any previous time. NSA whistleblower Edward Snowden, speaking from his home in Moscow, Russia. His memoir, Permanent Record, is out. We'll be back with him in a minute.